Good morning, guys. Um, so we're gonna go over how to do chi-square analysis. We're gonna do some statistics today. Okay, so flip to the next page in your in. I'm gonna title this chi oops, square. And then we have a symbol that represents chi-square. So we use the Greek symbol chi, which is like a little fancy X, and then we square it. So this is chi-square analysis. Okay. So I'm um, gonna go through the equation for this and then I'll kind of talk about like when you use this and why you use this. So our equation is chi-square equals the summation of observed data minus expected data squared divided by your expected data. So we say O minus E squared divided by E. So here we have chi-squares. This is what we're solving for. Okay. Uh, this is our summation. So we're gonna be adding up all the distinct categories we have. E stands for our expected data. What did we expect to occur? And O stands for our observed data. What actually occurred? What data did we collect? So essentially what a chi-square analysis does is it's testing to confirm a hypothesis. So I'm gonna go through an example. Typically we use it for genetics problems, but it actually can be used for like literally any research where you're trying to figure out, um, does my data match my hypothesis? Um, or is it due to, or is there some other factor in play that maybe I didn't consider before? Okay, so the question we're trying to answer is, is the difference between the observed data? So if um, I ask you to collect data on an experiment, that would be your observed data. So this is the data that we personally collected. So is the difference between the observed data and the expected data? Due to random variability. It's like naturally in the world, there's just random variability. If I asked you to flip a coin 10 times, you would expect expected data, you would expect to get heads five times and tails five times. What happens if you don't, right? Like let's say you get heads seven times and tails three times. So we would want to figure out is your observed data, the heads seven times, tails three times, significantly different from your expected data where it would be five and five. And so we're trying to figure out is the difference between our data sets due to just random variability, so just due to chance, Or is there another factor involved? So if I asked you to flip that coin 10 times and we would expect to get five heads, five tails, and we all flip our coins and some of us get like six and four, four and six, some of us get five and five, and then maybe somebody gets like nine and one. That person who got nine and one, the difference between their observed data nine and one and their expected data five and five is probably not due to random chance. There's probably some other factor involved, such as the coin might be weighted, and so it's causing the results to lean towards one option rather than the other. So when we do this with genetics problems, we're trying to figure out, when I do a Punnett square, I would expect this ratio of genotypes or phenotypes for my offspring. This is what I actually see is the difference between these two values due to random variance, or is there some other inheritance pattern involved? Like, are we looking at a co-dominant pattern or an incomplete dominant or a linked gene? So it kind of helps us confirm the genotypes of parents. Um, and then it also helps to determine if the data you've collected is reliable. So there's multiple parts to this uh, chi-square analysis. So the first thing you do with every chi-square analysis is you generate what's called your null hypothesis.
and the null hypothesis is abbreviated with H for hypothesis and a little null, it's a sub zero or H naught. And the null hypothesis is always the same. It never changes and it always states there is no statistical difference between the observed and expected data. So your null hypothesis essentially always states that any difference between your observed and expected data is due to random variability. So if we end up failing to reject this null hypothesis, then that means that this statement holds true, that the difference between our data is due to chance. If we reject our null hypothesis, that means that this statement does not hold true and that there has to be some other factor involved. So we're trying to just confirm um, our we call it the tentative hypothesis. Okay, I'm going to go through an example because that's like the easiest way to understand uh, chi-square analysis. So, let's say you're a geneticist and let's say that you are breeding pea plants. You're Mendel, okay? Uh, and then let's say the trait that you're specifically looking at is the seed pod color. And you know that having a green pod color, so these are my alleles, is dominant. Having a yellow pod color is recessive. Okay. Now, let's say that you have bred some plants and you didn't know the original genotypes of the parents, but you bred these plants and then you actually can see their offspring. And here's the data you've collected. So this is our observed data. You bred these plants, and then you counted them, and in your population, you have 36 plants are green, and two are yellow. So this is just the data you've collected, and then what we're trying, going to try to figure out is what are the genotypes of the parents, or like possible genotypes of the parents. Because if we look at this and we were to figure out the ratio, um, if, depending on the parent's genotypes, we would expect different ratios, okay? So let's write our tentative hypothesis. Let's say this is what you observed and you are hypothesizing, so your tentative hypothesis You're predicting that the parents of these offspring were heterozygote. So if our parents are heterozygote, we can actually figure out our expected ratios, right? Because if the parents are both heterozygote, that means we're going to cross a heterozygote with a heterozygote. That means you're going to have a Punnett square. Here's your gametes. Here's my sperm. Here's my eggs. Here's my fertilization events. Right? So looking at this, if the parents were heterozygote, we would expect 75% of them sorry, to be green, right, because we would expect 3 out of 4, and we would expect 25 of them, 25% of them to be yellow. It's best to work in percents when you're figuring out your expected data. Okay. Now what we need to do is we know what we would expect, we know what we have, but we need to convert these to be the same values because these are percents and these are um, whole numbers. So you want everything in whole numbers. You want number of individuals, number of like discrete things that are that category. So all we have to do is we have to take the total number in our population. So we have 36, 37, 38, and then we have to figure out of my 38, how many would we expect to be green? Right, so this would just be 0. 0.75 times 38. Uh, if you don't have a calculator, maybe get a calculator. 0. 0.35 times 78, we would expect ooh, 0. 0.75 times 38. We would expect 28.5 of our pea plants to be green. Okay, you do the same thing 0. 0.25 
times our total population 38 we would expect 9.5 to be yellow okay so you have to take the population number from your observed data because if we're trying to figure out this is my population of organisms how many would I expect to be green or yellow? We only know percents for that. So you need to apply those percentages to your population size, okay? So we have 36 plus 238 individual pea plants or pea pods, and then we figured out of those pea pods, how many should be green, how many should be yellow. So these two values right here, this is our observed data, or sorry, our expected data. Okay. So essentially you're going to take these values here and we're going to take these values here and we're going to compare them to each other. Okay, so we're going to do our chi-square equation right here. So we're going to do the summation of O minus E squared divided by E. So if you look here, the summation part comes into play depending on how many categories you have or results. So like for us, we could only have two results. They could be green or they could be yellow. So we're only going to have to add uh, two categories together. So chi-square equals, let's just start with our greens. So we're going to do O minus E squared divided by E. Summation, so plus, now we do yellow. O minus E squared divided by E. So you can kind of see, we're going to be looking for the difference between these two values. And the smaller the difference is, the smaller our chi-square is. Because if these two numbers were the same, then this value would be zero. So if you have a chi-square value of zero, it means that your observed data and your expected data were exactly the same. So the closer these numbers are to each other, the smaller your chi-square value is, and the more likely it is that your null hypothesis will be accepted, that there is no statistical difference between your values. So if we kind of flush this out, we find that each of these equals 1.97 plus 1.97, and so we get a final value of 3.94. So our chi-square value is 3.94, so put a box around that so you don't lose it. So this is our chi-square value. One mistake I see students make is they actually take the square root of this and they solve for chi. We don't want that. We're solving for chi-square, so just make sure you keep it as chi-square. Okay, now we have this value, so it's like, what do I do with that value? Okay, we need to find two other things. The next thing is called the degrees of freedom. And what the degrees of freedom does is it takes into account that the more options you have here, so if we had like four different options for pea pod color, the more variance there's going to be in your data. Versus if there's only two options, you'll typically have less variance due to chance. And so what degrees of freedom does is it kind of allows there to be wiggle room within the variance depending on how many distinct categories you have. So degrees of freedom to calculate it, it's really easy. It's just one less than the number of possible results. Okay, so when we're looking at our example here, we only had two possible results. They could be green or they could be yellow. So we had two results and then you subtract one. So our degrees of freedom, df equals one. Okay, put a box around that. We're just gonna keep track of everything we need with a little blue box. Okay, the next thing you need is called the p-value. So in bio, if you've taken AP stats, I believe you calculate your p-values. In bio, we kind of just um, reference the p-value, so it's a lot easier. Um, but for the p-value, you're going to use what's called a p-table, and I'm going to show you the p-table. Um, and it's going to be on your equation sheet, so you don't need to like memorize any of this. 
But essentially, the p-value is stating uh, what percent of the time is the difference between your observed and expected data due to chance or variance, okay? So for biologists, we've kind of like established a p-value that we feel is like our limit to determine if something is statistically different or not. And what biologists have determined um, is they use a p-value that equals 0 0.05 um, as their limit, okay? What a p-value of 0 0.05 means, so let's just kind of flush that out, a p-value of 0 0.05 says that variance between your observed data and your expected data would occur due to chance 5% of the time. Okay, 5% is really low because that's saying that the difference between O and E here would be due to randomness only 5% of the time. So that means 95% of the time, there's some other factor involved, okay? So biologists have just determined that the 0 0.05 is their limit. Any p-value less than that, they determine that the difference between these values is due to another factor and not due to randomness. So if our p-value of 0 0.05, if we have a p-value of 0.5 or greater, that means we would fail to reject our null. So we would typically accept the null. If your p-value is less than this, then that means we would reject the null and there is some other factor that's causing the discrepancy between these values. So we always work in our p.05 row. Always, always, always. So because this is a biologist limit, we're always just gonna kind of leave this as our little home row. So I'm gonna show you on your equation sheet for your test. This is what you're given. So you're given uh, the chi-square equation. My cursor. Here's your chi-square equation. You're given, um, so this is the smallest P table they could ever give you. But over here on the top, these are your degrees of freedom. So like if you had nine possible options, minus one, your degrees of freedom would be eight. So you'd be working here. So our degrees of freedom were one for this. And then we're always in the P equals 0 0.05. Okay, so this is like our limit. So our limit is here. If you have a value that is equal to or uh, less than 0 0.05, then we would have to reject our null hypothesis. So here's what we're gonna do. We need to find what's called our critical values. So these numbers written in the table are referred to as critical values, and they're gonna be used to kind of compare our chi-square too. So we had degrees of freedom of one. We're gonna work in the 0 0.05. So our critical value is 3.84. So let's write that down. So our critical value So you find that just by using your p-table, you just find the intersection between your degrees of freedom and p equals 0 0.05. So our critical value is 3.84. So you don't calculate that, you just locate that on the table. So let's put a blue box. Okay, so let's just make a note. This is the one you just locate on P table. And that P table is on your equation sheet, so you'll just have that. So all you need to know is you need to know you need to be in this row, and you need to know how to find degrees of freedom to find your critical value. The last thing we do is now all we do is compare our chi-square value to our critical value, and we just figure out which one is greater and which one is less. So all you have to do to find your conclusion is you're gonna compare your chi-square value to your critical value. So our chi-square value is 3.94. That's greater than our critical value, which was 3.84. Okay, so we're just saying this number is higher than this number. My cat's playing with a toy. All right, so now that we've established this rule, so if the chi-score was lower, you would just change your symbol here, okay? Um, and then I came up with a very, it's kind of inappropriate, but I came up with a statement on how to remember 
what these numbers mean. Okay, here's your statement. If the CV critical value is low, reject the hoe. Okay, let's break this down. If, if your critical value is low, so lower than your chi-score value, you're gonna reject the null hypothesis. So it looks like it says how, but remember that's the symbol for null hypothesis. So that statement just kind of helps you remember the relationship between these two and what that means about your null hypothesis. So if the critical value is lower than your chi-square value, which it is, we're gonna reject the null hypothesis. So our critical value is 3.84, that is less than our 3.94. So our conclusion would be to reject our null hypothesis. So we would have a concluding statement Uh, we're going to reject our null hypothesis. If you reject the null hypothesis, that means this statement is not true. So that means there is a statistical difference between our observed and expected data. Blah. A statistical difference between O and E. Okay, so what that means is that means that the difference between these two values and these two values, they're so different from each other that this hypothesis can't be true. The difference between what we got and what we expected, the variance between these values is not due to random chance. What it's saying is that it's due to some other factor. And when you're doing genetics problems, typically that other factor is that your tentative hypothesis was wrong. So we could do this chi-square analysis again and do uh, maybe one of the parents was homozygous dominant and the other parent was homozygous recessive and we could figure out the values there and run the thing again. Um, but what it's doing is it's, it's kind of like a backwards way of testing this hypothesis. So we're testing this hypothesis, is it due to chance or not? And that kind of tells you if this hypothesis can be confirmed or not. So based on this example, because there is a statistical difference between our observed and expected data, that means this hypothesis is incorrect, most likely. Or it could be that they are heterozygote, but maybe the genes are linked or something like that, and it's causing green and yellow to uh, appear in different ways because they're linked with another trait or gene. Okay, so that's how you do chi-square. So you kind of need to like go through those steps. Um, I wanted to show you. So this is the lab you're going to be doing. So you can either use this picture of the corn right here, which is a really nice picture, um, or there's a corn genetics gallery and I linked it on our Google Doc as well. So essentially the first thing you're actually going to do is you're going to figure out your expected data. So right here where it says create a Punnett square or do a mathematical system, so you should do your law of multiplication here. You're figuring out what um, expected ratios or percentages would we expect for each of these combinations, okay? They told you that the parent's genotype is right here. So this is the cross you would do, and then these are the percentages you need to figure out. Then for number two, this is where you get your observed data. So you're just gonna count, and I, in my example I said, just count your entire photo. You're just gonna count, of the ones you can see, how many are purple and smooth. So these ones are all purple smooth, and they kind of label them nicely. So A is purple smooth. If they have like a little dimple, that's fine, they're still smooth, because you can tell like these are real wrinkly. And then purple shrunken would be these raisin looking ones. Yellow smooth are here, yellow wrinkly are here. So just of the ones you can see, you just need to count and tell me how many are these categories. And this would be your observed data. And then it tells you down here, it shows you how to calculate. So this would be my total. So how many total kernels did you have times your, oh, they gave you the expected, whatever, times the expected ratio to give you your actual um, expected numbers. Your observed numbers come from right here. You just counted them. And then this is doing your chi-square. You'd get your chi-square value here. And then this lab actually goes through how to do um, all the different like 
goodness of fits and stuff like that. So you're going to do this first one right here uh, is for the corn picture. So this first page is all for the corn picture. And then once you get to the problems, these are all just example problems for you to practice your chi-square. So there's three example problems. Um, I'll post the key to this on Saturday when I post the other keys. So you can turn it in and then see if you did it right or not. And then this is an assessment. So if you turn it in and you get it back, you realize you did all of them wrong, uh, you're gonna have an opportunity to retake and redo this lab so that you can resubmit it for full credit. All right. Let me know if you have any questions. I miss you guys so freaking much. All right, I'll talk to you later. Bye.